After over a thousand and four hundred days of hiatus, Yoshihiro Togashi has finally returned. This video will be a breakdown of the succession contest so far, detailing all the different factions involved, the Nen abilities, the current locations of characters and their intentions. This will by no means be a full comprehensive recap of the arc so far because that would literally take days. The Succession War is shaping up to be the most ambitious piece of storytelling I have seen in all of manga. There are hundreds of subplots working in tandem to deliver this incredibly complex contest for Succession. I have included some links in the description to helpful sources for the making of this video, one of which is an infographic that clearly outlines all of the relevant factions in this arc, and that really shows you just how complex this story is. The purpose of this video is to remind everybody what is going on. It has been 4 years since chapter 390 released and not everybody has the time or energy to reread the arc completely, so this video will serve as a quick breakdown of everything you need to know for the rest of the arc, especially all the characters involved. However, I must say there is no better way to learn all the intricacies of this arc than to just read it yourself, so if you really want to know something I don't answer in this video, go read. And lastly, before we begin, I apologise in advance if I butcher any of the pronunciations of these names. They're pretty difficult to say the least. There's no better place to start than chapter 338 or the final episode of the anime. Atop the world tree, Jing tells his son that this massive tree that towers above everything else in their world is actually much shorter than it could have been. Actual world trees are so tall they leave the atmosphere, but they can only be found in the dark continent which is outside of the known world and outside of the map that most people are familiar with. The world they know of is only one part of a much bigger world. The Chimera Ants as well as Aluka originate from this bigger world, this dark continent that Jing dreams to venture. This brings us on to the Dark Continent Expedition Arc, a 9 chapter stretch that focuses on the Kakin Empire's decision to expand to the Dark Continent with an expedition team led by Beyond, who is the son of the late chairman Netero. The known world of Hunter x Hunter is composed of six continents, one of which being the Asian continent that contains the Kakin Empire. In the past, this empire was small and threatened by its neighbouring countries, so the first king of Kakin conjured the seed urn inspired by Worm Toxin and had his children fight in a succession contest for the throne, which ultimately turned the small nation into the superpower it's known as in the current day. Nasobi, the current king of the Kakin Empire, wishes to continue this deadly tradition and conducts a succession war during the voyage of the Black Whale towards the New Continent. The New Continent is not technically part of the DC, but it's still outside of the known world and they're going there because of some political scheming trying to prevent them from going to the actual DC and pretending that this New Continent is the real thing. The seed urn is used once again to bestow Nen Beasts to each of the princes and basically form a blood pact that each prince will partake in this contest. So essentially, and this is really simplifying things, this arc focuses on the voyage of the Black Whale towards the new continent with 200,000 people aboard the ship. This includes various factions like the Zodiacs who Leorio and Kurapika have now joined, members of the Hunter Association like Hanzo and Biski, the Kakin Empire involving King Nasubi and his 14 princes, several mafia families, the Phantom Troop, Hisoka, Beyond, a court of justice and so many more. There are even general passengers, like poor people who applied for the expedition for whatever reason. It's likely that their lives had no meaning and they were inspired by Beyond's pitch for the Dark Continent, so they signed up for this ridiculous expedition. The civilians were picked by lottery, with the chances of 1 in 1300 people landing a seat, painting this voyage as something rare and incredible that you just need to be part of, when really that paint will be made up of blood. The first major event in the arc is the battle between Hisoka and Krollo in Heaven's Arena. This fight is a devastating loss for Hisoka who literally dies at the hands of Krollo, but through a post-mortem Nen technique he resuscitates himself back to life. 
Crollo and the rest of the Phantom Troop view themselves as a singular entity, the Spider, and thus Hisoka has extended his desire for vengeance on Crollo to the entire troop, proceeding to kill Shaunok and Kotopi immediately after reviving himself. Two down, ten to go. He intends to kill the entire Phantom Troop and that strong desire for bloodshed is reflected by the troop too, who really want to kill Hisoka to avenge their fallen brothers. Illumi has joined the Phantom Troop because he has his own reasons for wanting to kill Hisoka as well as most likely just protecting his little brother Kaluto who is a member of the troop that Hisoka will definitely try to kill. This conflict is one of various that take the main stage of this arc with both Hisoka and the Phantom Troop being present on the Black Whale. So far we haven't seen Hisoka a single time. The Black Whale 1 is a ship built for the Kakin expedition to the new continent. It is able to carry 200,000 passengers and serves as the setting for the events of this arc. It is absolutely fucking massive, to the point where airships and ferries have to be employed to transport people and supplies to and from the ship because it cannot be tied up to a dock. The interior was specifically designed to be simple so as to reduce the building cost and increase the production rate. The ship is split into 5 separate tiers according to their wealth and social class. Those travelling in the first and second tiers are the wealthiest passengers on board, like the royal family for example. The lower three tiers are zones for general passengers. The entire ship is under martial law which means the royal army is busy at work keeping things in check ensuring people don't try to travel between tiers. In order to move between the third and fifth tiers, passengers must buy tickets either from the royal family or the mafia. Tier 1 consists of the Kakin royal family, big name politicians and all of their staff. There are 800 guards and soldiers roaming the halls of tier 1, 150 of which are members of the Hunter Association. There's a massive banquet hall that serves as an assembly room for social gatherings and that is where the departure ceremony took place as well as dinner parties that take place every Sunday. This tier is the main setting for the Succession War. Tier 2 accommodates celebrities and other rich people. We know very little about what's going on in tier 2 but there are 600 guards and soldiers stationed there. Tier 3 is where the main medical and political wards are. There's a courthouse, police station, an office for the royal army, a hospital, a clinic, a research institute for medicine, as well as an observation deck that's part of a resort town filled with lounges, shops and bars. This is where the Haile family office is located and is also where the Zodiacs are for the most part, though they do obviously move around. Tier 4 is the largest in terms of size, but despite that there's only one clinic in this entire tier and it's said that the number of civilians per one soldier of the royal army exceeds 300. Due to this it heavily relies on the Chiyu family's influence and it is where their office is located. Tier 5 is located at the very bottom of the black whale, the smallest of all the tiers with potentially the most passengers. It has only one clinic with no dedicated doctors and like tier 4, the number of civilians per one soldier of the royal army exceeds 300 and so it relies on the Char family's influence and this is where their office is located as well. And finally we arrive at the longest and most important part of the video. On the screen right now is a key for you to understand certain symbols that I will use for certain characters. There are some details within these factions that are very difficult to explain so I'll use visual aids to better lay things out. Once again, thank you very much to the dedicated Hunter Hunter fans who made infographics and reddit threads that were crucial to the making of this video. I have linked their stuff in the description below as well as an imager link of my charts that I made for this video which are pretty extensive as well. The king of the Kakin Empire is Nasubi Hui Guoro. Nasubi has 8 legal wives and 14 legal children, which he considers all princes, even the girls because gender has no bearing on succession within the Kakin royal family. When it comes to Nen we can assume that he has at least basic abilities of his own since he is seemingly able to see his children's guardian spirit beasts. He also won the succession contest of his generation which implies some level of power, at least willpower and intelligence. His own guardian spirit beast looks like a bunch of titties with a massive tongue hanging out of its disgusting mouth which is reflective of his lustful behaviour and inability to be faithful to a single woman. He is impulsive and goes from one woman to the next. 
We know nothing about the beast's ability so far, beyond it being able to block a bullet fired at Nasubi, but it's probably broken considering he has won a succession contest in the past. He is a pretty cold-hearted individual and believes that only a strong person may sit at Kakin's throne. He seems to genuinely love and care for his children, but he's very much shackled to the royal customs he was born into, encouraging his children to fight to the death in order to gain the throne just like he did. There are 8 different queens that constitute the 14 princes in the Kakin royal family. The names Togashi uses for these queens reflect which number they are with a numerical theme taken from various languages. They are all considered equals and there is no official ranking among the wives. The numbers are simply the order in which Nasubi married them. However, there is an unofficial system in place that prevents lower queens from spying on higher queens and their princes, which does give them an unfair advantage. As for the children, the first five are known as the senior princes and even though there is no official ranking, they have far more to work with than the other princes. Like the queens though, after five the numbers don't mean much since they are simply the order of birth. First queen Unma is the mother of Benjamin and Sarydnik. Second queen Dwazul is the mother of Camilla, Tubepa, Luzerus and Haukenberg. Third queen Tang Zhao Li is the mother of Zhang Lei. 4th Queen Katrono is the mother of Tyson. 5th Queen Swinko Swinko is the mother of Sale Sale. 6th Queen Seiko is the mother of the twins Kacho and Fugetsu. 7th Queen Sivanchi is the mother of Momose and Mariam. And lastly, 8th Queen Oito is the mother of Wobu. Nearly all of these queens, with the exception of Savanchi and Oito, have their own surveillance guards placed in the factions of other princes that aren't their children, in order to gain information that may assist in any way through this succession contest. The first prince is Benjamin. He is the deputy military advisor of the royal army, which means he has political influence, a bunch of connections and followers. Out of all the princes, his employees are by far the most loyal and competent, with the exception of my boy Kurapika of course. Benjamin doesn't just want the throne of Kakin, but his ultimate goal is the unification of the world under Kakin rule, essentially world domination. He is much like his father in the sense that he sees nothing wrong with killing his siblings for the throne and maintaining the traditions of the royal family. Benjamin is a very powerful individual who has introduced choking a lion to death and when it comes to Nen, he seems to be one of the most experienced out of all the princes so far. Despite being a Nen user, he is unable to see his guardian spirit beast, which the captain of his guard suspects is a condition of the beasts themselves. He is currently under house arrest due to the incident with Camilla. These are all of his guards we have seen so far. The most notable are Balsamilko, Furikov, Rihan and Babimina, all of which are confirmed Nen users. Balsamilko is the captain of the guards who has shown extreme intelligence so far. He is logical, analytical and as the captain he calls most of the shots with Benjamin's judgement taken into account. Furikov is a snarky, confident guy and considers Benjamin his only family, which he demonstrated when he broke Camilla's arm. Rihan, the man behind this manga's most infamous page, is a very perceptive and deductive individual. He thinks long and hard about his decisions and quite easily handled Sale Sale's guardian spirit beast with his predator Nen ability, which devours its target depending on how much knowledge Rihan has on them. And lastly, Babi Mina, in my opinion, the most interesting of Benjamin's guards. He stands out the most, being very calm and composed, and he has spent most of his time around Kurapika, making some decisions that make his loyalty to Benjamin feel kinda questionable in a way. So far, three of the guards have died, Shikaku, Vincent, and Muse. The second prince is Camilla. Like Benjamin, she sees nothing wrong with killing her siblings in a sadistic manner, which heavily contrasts with her general demeanour. She seems charming and elegant, but she can be quite heartless. She sees herself as someone who could change this wrong world. When it comes to Nen, it seems Camilla is the number one most experienced out of all the princes at this current moment in time. Camilla uses post-mortem Nen to her advantage and employs it in her counteractive Nen ability, which made even the all-confident Benjamin hesitate about killing her. Her guardian spirit beast is a manipulator type, which kinda looks like broccoli and sort of reminds me of Nasubi's beast. These are all of Camilla's guards we have seen so far. 
Her guards include the Untouchables, a group of individuals in her private guard that have a curse type post-mortem Nen, with each guard responsible for cursing one prince. So far, we know very little about the guards individually, but Sarahel, the captain, being responsible for cursing the 14th Prince Wobul that Kurapika is guarding, tells me they will have a pretty important role going forward. They intend to get close to Wobul during Kurapika's Nen training lessons. The third prince is Zhang Lei. He is allied with the Qi Yu, one of the three great mafia families in Kakin's underworld. He seems to be a tolerant and respectful individual you can negotiate with based on his interactions with Kurapika and Queen Oito. He also declared that he is not participating in the contest because he wishes to, but of course his life is on the line and he is the type of man to kill if he has to. His guardian spirit beast is a conjurer type which looks like this mix of the sun and a vault, and it produces a coin from its mouth every day. The owner of a coin will gain various abilities fulfilling certain conditions, and the value of the coin increases over time. We still have no idea what exactly this means. We know very little about Zhang Lei's guards, but I've put them on the screen regardless. His affiliation with the Qi Yu family seems to be where most of his military might will come from, but more on them later. We do have one very interesting thing to make note of though. Coven Toba, a member of Benjamin's faction, took the first coin for himself without alerting Zhang Lei, and Tenftori was given the second coin which is believed by them to be the first coin. This will definitely prove to be important down the line. The fourth prince is none other than Sarajnik, the terror sandwich himself. This man is... He, He's something else, man. He's just he's just something else, man. But I'll refrain from fawning over his character and focus on the key details for the purpose of this video. Sridnik's a very smart, very proud, and very terrifying man. He has a strong love and interest for the arts, which is why he is in possession of the remaining Kurta eyes. He is sinister and inhumane to say the least. He finds gruesome slaughter to be delightful and he combines this with his love of art, collecting the body parts of people he kills and so forth. Halkenberg is the only sibling he seems to get along with, which is really interesting considering the differences in their moral compasses, but I do think this is a result of Halkenberg just being ignorant of Sarajnik's darkness. When it comes to Nen, Sarajnik only activated his abilities recently on the Black Whale. But his talent is simply unheard of, he is a complete prodigy, and once he masters Zetsu, it is fucking over for everybody else on the ship. He is a specialist type Nen user with a currently unnamed ability that allows him to see 10 seconds into the future instantaneously, which he refers to as precognition. There's a bunch of other names for it in the fandom, like ephemeral 10 seconds or parallel future, but yeah, it's, 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 I don't know, precognition. It's a pretty complex ability and I'm not going to explain it any further because we'll be here for a while and I'm sure there are fantastic videos on that topic already. On top of the Guardian Spirit Beast bestowed upon him through the Seed Urn, he has summoned a full-fledged Nen Beast without even being aware of it, which means he has two beasts. The Guardian Spirit Beast can phase through walls and detect hostile aura, but its main ability is triggered when someone lies to Sarajnik. If you lie to him several times, you will cease to exist as a human. And seeing as Sarajnik likes to turn human corpses into sculptures, I think it's pretty obvious what that means. Theta's face after this says enough. As you can see on the screen, none of Sarajnik's personal guard have been named so far. They really don't seem to matter, and he doesn't seem to care about them either. He is completely focused on himself, and he also has an alliance with one of the three Mafia families. The only actual competent guards he has are Theta and Sarkov, and they're not even on his side. They're both provisional hunters, and they actually want to kill him out of fear of his terrifying potential and capacity for evil. Theta attempted this, but failed because of his precognitive ability, and things are looking very worrying for her. The fifth prince is Tubepa, and her main reason for even trying in the succession contest is because she considers Benjamin, Camilla, and Zhang to be filth. She doesn't view any of the younger princes as genuine competitors, and she currently has a truce with Sarajnik and Kurapika, who she really wants on her side. She's a very smart woman, but when it comes to Nen, she knows next to nothing. Her guardian spirit beast is a transmuter type that looks like a frog, and is known to be extremely cautious, reflecting Tubepa's nature. It produces a variety of drugs within its body. 
These are all of Tubepa's guards we've seen so far, none of these guys are really that important, but as you can see, Rihan has been assigned to her, which means we can expect some sort of conflict soon enough. Mayor is the captain of the guards, and he has displayed extreme loyalty to Tubepa through his composed and keen behaviour in Kurapika's Nen lessons. The sixth prince is Tyson, who believes that her teachings based on love can change the world, and despite being involved in a succession war, opposes violent action. Her guardian spirit beast is an emission type which essentially attaches itself to anybody who read the book of Tyson and collects aura from them by bestowing happiness in return. The degree of happiness received depends on how thoroughly one has read the book of Tyson, her book based on love which she believes can change the world. These are all of Tyson's gods, and as you can see, none of them have been named besides Izunavi and Giuliano, both of which being pro-hunters, with Uzunavi actually showing up in the past as Kurapika's teacher. Giuliano has fallen victim to the Book of Tyson, which is essentially brainwashing him to love the prince, whilst Izunavi is being very careful, telling Giuliano he is getting too emotionally involved and that he should prioritise his job as a bodyguard. They are also both rock stars and performed at the first Sunday banquet. The seventh prince is Luzerus, who loves smoking weed, or clean leaf I should say, and wishes to rehabilitate drug addicts through that healthy substance. Sarajnik thinks he's a moron, but he thinks that of basically everyone, so it's hard to take his words at face value. The fact of the matter is, Luzerus seems pretty competent, with his reaction to finding out about Nen and his guardian spirit beast, as well as his alliance with one of the Mafia families, which I'll get into later. Luzerus's guardian spirit beast is a conjurer type that looks like a centipede and makes use of pseudo-coercive manipulation. Fully explaining this will take ages, so pause the screen and look at this explanation from the wiki if you're interested, but it essentially sets traps by conjuring whatever the target desires as bait, and activating itself once they fall for it. These are all of Luzerus' guards, they haven't been all that important so far either, but three of them are provisional hunters, Basho, Ridge and Skert. Basho is a character we've seen before in the York New City arc, a former bodyguard for the Nostradi family who is a part of Kurapika's mission on the boat. Luzerus is the last of the three princes who have an alliance with the three great mafia families, in his case the Shah family, but again, more on that later. The eighth prince was Saleh Saleh, yeah. <laughs> There's honestly very little we're gonna go over this piece of... I don't, I don't even know man, he's just... The <laughs> he's just a waste, an absolute waste of oxygen and I'm glad he got packed up. I don't know man, something about him, I just, I just did not like him bro, he was just insufferable. If you want to remember anything that happened to him, just go and read the manga because as I said, this video is geared towards everything you need to know going forward and... This guy's dead, so you don't need to know anything about him to be fair. I've still created a chart for him and his gods as you can see on the screen. Yes, I copied from the wiki because this guy is just not worth my time. At all, I don't care. He's not worth my I'm not making a chart for him. Those charts took me like 30 to 45 minutes each and there's 20 of them. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. But yeah, it's, it's still pretty cool to see how many players there are involved in this arc and depicting that with these infographics is pretty damn neat. So there you go. There's the wiki copied. Uh, enjoy. The ninth prince is one of my personal favourites, Halkenberg. He's a very popular and controversial man, considering assassins posed the risk before the succession contest even began. He is super smart, entering the world's top university at 15 and majoring in physics, and he has a decent relationship with Sarajnik as previously discussed. But yeah, that's probably just because he doesn't know his half-brother all that well. He won a silver medal in the Archery World Championship, which ties into his Nen ability that he awakened during this arc, the Possession Arrow. After trying to convince his father to call off the Succession War but ultimately failing, Halkenberg resolved to win the contest as it is the only way to change the world, even though he is very much against killing his own siblings. Possession Arrow allows him to harness the aura of his subordinates and inject the consciousness of one of his subordinates into whatever body he strikes. Super broken and definitely a skill to watch out for in the remainder of this war. His guardian spirit beast is an enhancement type that kinda looks like a hairy cyclops with the one eye and its ability impresses a leaf-like mark on the left palm of Halkenberg's guards. This mark allows them to attach themselves to Halkenberg and provide him with their aura, essentially turning the group into a single unit in terms of Nen, which Halkenberg makes use of with his possession arrow. These are all of Halkenberg's guards, who also haven't been that important so far, but Shikaku and Vict, who were originally members of Benjamin's guard, have been possessed by Halkenberg and now serve him. 
Well, at least Vic serves him because Shikaku committed suicide in what is probably the most hilarious page I've ever seen. The 10th prince was Kacho, but she is dead in possibly the saddest, but also most interesting way possible. Kacho's twin sister is Fugetsu, and her guardian spirit essentially takes on the form of the twin who dies first, protecting the surviving twin until they also die. Very cool beast that reflects Kacho's immense love for her sister really, really well. So basically, even though Kacho is dead, Fugetsu thinks she's still alive and so we'll see her on screen a lot, which is fucking evil of Tagashi, but hey, I'll gladly have my heartstrings tugged at for good writing. These are all of Kacho's guards we have seen. Out of them all, the only one that really matters so far is Melody, who we are all pretty familiar with. She originally signed up to this mission on Korapika's behalf, but now she seriously wants to help Kacho and Fugetsu escape this terrifying contest. Of course she failed, but I'm not so sure she even knows that yet. Saraidnik is also super interested in Melody, which should give us one of the best moments in this arc so far, so I am super excited to see them meet and see Melody lose her shit when she hears that sinister heartbeat. I have a really cool theory coming regarding those two characters, so please like the video and subscribe if that is something you're interested in. Fugetsu is the 11th prince and the twin sister of the late Kacho. Like I just said, she doesn't know Kacho is dead and thinks she is spending time with her. Sad. Her guardian spirit beast is essentially a mutual cooperation type that serves as a wormhole. Fugetsu controls the departing trip and Kacho controls the returning trip. No clue how this is going to work now that Kacho's dead, but only time will tell. These are all of Fugetsu's guards we have seen. Lady Olus has been stated by Kurapika to be the quickest learner in the Nen classes, but we can't completely trust this since it could very well be a bluff to motivate the others to learn, given Lady Olus' demeanour and overall behaviour as a non-combatant worker. Not an actual guard, but more like a caretaker. Bachaim, 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 B-A-C-H-A-E-M and Ryoji are Fugetsu's only actual guards and we know next to nothing about them. On top of this, there are surveillance guards from five of the eight queens in Fugetsu's faction that we have yet to be introduced to. The 12th prince is Mamose, who was first to die in this succession contest. For that reason, there really isn't much to talk about regarding her. She seemed to be a pretty pure and innocent girl, but Tufti, who served the third queen, gave her a face full of pillows, so I guess we'll never know. At least my boy Hanzo packed him up and made it look like a suicide, which has created serious confusion amongst most of the factions ever since. Cool move, Hanzo. Very cool indeed. Like I did for Saleh Saleh, I have still created a chart for Momose, but yes, I took from the wiki because uh, I'm not working for dead people, okay? They're dead. They don't matter anymore. Most of these guys, including Hanzo, were reassigned to the 13th Prince's Guard, which is kind of like the reason Momose died, because Queen Savanti is a terrible mother who played favourites with her little boy, who we will now discuss. The 13th Prince is Queen Savanti's little boy, Mariam. He looks like a four year old and his best friend is a hamster. Real sad that he has to partake in this bloodbath of a contest, but hey, such is life when you're born into the Kakin royalty. His guardian spirit beast is pretty damn cool though. It looks like a dragon and the team suspect that it is behind the temporal barrier around room 1013. Exiting and phoning the room is permitted, but trying to enter the room transports you to an alternate empty room. This makes killing Mariam pretty damn difficult. These are all of Mariam's guards we have seen so far. Among them are three pro hunters, two of which we are very familiar with, and the third is a new character entirely who has been given an unusual amount of screen time. These are of course Bisky, Hanzo, and Beleriante. Be Beleriante? Be Beleriante or Beleriante? Please let me know in the comment section. Please, please. I I'm I hate this name. It's Beleriante. Beleriante. It's spelt like Belrainty, but it's like that. That's not a name. It has to be Beleriante. I don't know, man. Bisky and Hanzo are here on Kurapika's behalf, but they've also invested themselves in this succession contest as moral agents who think this war is seriously messed up, as they should. Bele. That guy is a little interesting, and there are a bunch of theories speculating why he has so much screen time in comparison to other regular guards. Some people think he's behind Silent Majority, which is a pretty cool theory. Keep an eye out for this guy, I suspect he'll be important. And finally, the 14th prince is the baby girl, Wobble. Queen Oito is really who we're going to be talking about here because Wobble is literally a baby, I don't know what I could possibly talk about regarding her. 
Oito is a woman who came from poverty and fell for King Nasubi simply because he gave her a chance at financial freedom, to live the glamorous life she always wanted. But now that she has given birth to Wobu and learned that this baby who cannot do anything without her has been forcefully enlisted into a deadly contest, she regrets it all. She went to extreme lengths to hire the right bodyguards to protect her daughter and that brought her Kurapika. But before that, let's talk about Wobu's guardian spirit beast. We know nothing, like literally nothing, we haven't even seen the beast. Babimina suspects that the fact that the beast has not shown itself once could be due to Wobu being too young, or to the guardian spirit beast possessing a counteractive ability, something like Kachos which only activated upon death. Only time can tell. These are all of Wobu's guards we have seen, and as you can tell, most of them are dead. In fact, all of them besides three of the four killing the fourth pro hunter Curtin, rendering him a non-factor moving forward. The last two pro hunters are essentially carrying everything on their backs. Kurapika has been doing most of the work and conducting Nen lessons for a variety of reasons, mainly to build connections with other factions and study them for reconnaissance purposes. Bill has been pretty helpful and he's trying his best despite not even initially knowing there was a succession war taking place on the ship. He and Sayed were hired through Pariston and were originally assigned there to bypass the Hunter Association's security checks. Their main mission is the exploration of the Dark Continent but they've been sucked into this contest for succession. Same thing happened to Kurapika. His main mission is to recover the last of the Kurta clan's eyes from the fourth prince Saridnik, but he has been sucked into this contest out of a desire to protect Oito and Wobul and keep the promise he made to them. The situation has been getting more and more complicated for Kurapika. It's almost inevitable that he will eventually have to choose between his original mission and this succession contest that he has been dragged into. The Haile family is one of the three largest mafia families in the Kakin Empire, with 23 members including its boss Morena. Fourth Prince Saridnik is one of their benefactors and this alliance could explain why the Terra Sandwich's guards have been kind of unimportant so far, with the exception of the two that are actively trying to kill him. The Mafia family is based in tier 3 and they are currently taking part in their own contest, one that can basically be boiled down to mass murder. The contest is simple, 1 point equals 1 level. Killing a normal person gives you 1 point, killing a Nen user gives you 10 points, and killing a Prince gives you 50 points. If you reach level 21, a unique ability will manifest. Once you reach level 100, you can initiate your own 22 followers and restart the cycle. The only named members of the Hailey family so far are Luini and Cashew, the former having gained 24 points already. Cashew is kinda taking it easy for now, but I assume he'll have gained quite a number of points when we next see him. And of course, the boss of this family is Morena, the illegitimate daughter of King Nasubi. She has two parallel scars that run from her forehead to the left corner of her mouth, a mark that symbolizes her illegitimacy as Nasubi's daughter. As a result of this, Marina has developed incredibly destructive behaviour. She takes no interest in the succession contest, the world at large, or even her own life. Her only goal is to destroy this dung heap of a world, which she wishes to accomplish through orchestrating this contest of indiscriminate killing through her Nen ability, which created this whole killing for points contest that I previously explained. The Chiyu family is another one of the three largest mafia families in the Kakin Empire, led by Onyo Longbao, the illegitimate half-brother of King Nasubi which is reflected in his forehead scar. Third Prince Zhang Lei is one of their benefactors which could also explain why we haven't seen much of his guards. This mafia family is where most of his military might will come from. The underboss or second in command of the Chiyu is Hinrik, a man who through Nen can turn any device he touches into a living creature while retaining its original function. Under him are Zakuro and Lynch of the name character so far, and the family's current goal is to find Hisoka before the Phantom Troop to prevent the carnage that will follow whenever any of these two bump into each other. Oh, and they had the most members at the start of the voyage, but 300 of them have already been killed as a result of the Hailey's competition, which has triggered an all-out war between the Mafia families. This family is located in Tier 4. The Shah family is the last of the three largest Mafia families in the Kakin Empire, led by Broccoli. Yes, Broccoli. Don't ask me why that's his name, it just is. He is also an illegitimate half-brother of the king, and his scar runs horizontally across his face. Also, I'd like to make it clear that there is no official ranking for those three families. We don't know who's the largest, we just know that these are the top three in the Empire. 
Seventh Prince Luzarus is one of the Shah family's benefactors and there's an uncanny resemblance between him and Broccoli. The Shah family have been working alongside the Chiyu family to locate Hisoka and will most likely work with them against the Hai Li family, since 8 of their 250 members have already been killed by the Hai Li. Tajo is the vice boss of the family who are located in tier 5. We don't actually know the Phantom Troops reasoning for boarding the Black Whale yet. We can assume it's either to kill Hisoka or to rob the princes, it's definitely one of those two, but which one came first? Why are they on the ship? Did Hisoka board the ship before them? Why? Isn't he after the Phantom Troop? But they're also after him. Maybe he knew they would seize this opportunity as the thieves they are, so he boarded the ship knowing they would come here, and so the Phantom Troop went ahead with their original plan of robbing the ship, which was halted by Hisoka's murder of Shaunok and Kortopi. But still, like, which one came first? Did Hisoka come to the ship first, or did the Phantom Troop come to the ship first? And either way, whichever one came first, why did they come here? We don't know, it's quite confusing right now, but since it's so confusing and it's one of those things that really needs to be addressed, I expect it to be cleared up pretty soon. What we do know is that their primary objective is kill Hisoka. There is nothing they want more than kill Hisoka. Once that's done, and only once that's done, they can go ahead with their heist and rub the hell out of all the rich folk in the higher tiers, or lower tiers, in, in tiers 1 and 2, because <laughs> it's technically higher in terms of the surface, but it's also like a lower number. Illumi is now a member of the Phantom Troop replacing Uvogin, which was a very sudden and equally surprising reveal when that chapter first came out. But it makes a lot of sense, right? He wants to kill his husband Hisoka just as much as the rest of the troop, and his little brother is now a target of the bloodthirsty clown, so he's gotta be there to protect him. There's a theory floating around that Illumi is Hisoka, and it's pretty cool, sure, but I, I, I don't want that to be the case. I don't think it's going to be the case at all, and I intend to explain why in an upcoming video. But yeah, essentially the Phantom Troop are here to avenge Shaunok and Kortopi by hunting down Hisoka, and that has added a whole new layer to this arc entirely. The the potential for this group in this story is genuinely out of this world, to the point where talking about it here, it, it's just going to take so much time, I have to force myself to refrain because boy there is just way too much to talk about, like so many exciting possibilities come from just the Phantom Troops inclusion in this arc. And finally, wow, the last of the factions, <laughs> we're finally here, the Zodiacs. All of the Zodiacs are here who Leorio and Kurapika have now joined. They have not, I repeat, they have not been ordered by Netero to travel the Dark Continent, explore it and return successfully. For this ridiculous mission that they have not, I repeat, not been ordered to undertake, they have split themselves into several teams with their own individual functions for the Dark Continent expedition which extends to this voyage on the Black Whale. The science team is comprised of Cheadle, Gel, and Leorio, who must ensure proper medical care and create disease control procedures. The flora and fauna team is comprised of Cluck and Ginter, who must gather intelligence and plants after landing on the Dark Continent. The intelligence team is comprised of Kurapika, Muzaistom, Pion, and Sacho, who must gather information about Beyond and Kakin, perform background checks on the 289th Hunter exam candidates, obtain a passenger list of the Black Whale 1, and confirm its data as well as make a language analysis software in case of contact with civilizations on the Dark Continent. And lastly, the defense team is comprised of Botobai, Kanzai, and Sayu, who are secretly collaborating with the intelligence team to create a post-landing defense strategy and a plan to prevent Beyond's escape. They must supervise Beyond and ensure security in the Dark Continent. Really ironic that Sayu is in the defense team when he has been discovered as a rat, a secret Beyond supporter and informant for his cause. The Zodiacs can't really do anything about Sayu at the moment, but they are keeping tabs on him in secret, planning to arrest him right before arriving at the Dark Continent. Continent. The Zodiacs serve even more roles during this voyage, with Botobai, for example, serving as public prosecutor and military analyst. And there we go, I think that's it for the character breakdown. There's also a judicial branch that characters like Cleopatra and Steiner are part of, but I didn't think they were necessary to include. Unfortunately, we're not done though. There is more I want to discuss in this video, but I'll keep this final section as short as possible. A quick timeline of the arc so far. I'm not going to be detailing all the key events that take place at different times because that would take a very very long time. For an arc that's only about 40 chapters so far, a 
fuck ton of stuff has happened since the beginning. Instead, I will be detailing what chapters take place at what times. Thank you very much to Reddit user Gukaruby5 for this information. Sunday the 8th of August consists of chapters 358 to 368. Monday the 9th of August consists of chapters 369 to 376. Tuesday the 10th of August consists of chapters 376 to 380. Wednesday the 11th of August consists of chapters 380 to 382. And Thursday and Friday the 12th and 13th of August happened entirely off screen. Saturday the 14th of August is chapter 384. Sunday the 15th of August the first banquet consists of chapters 382, 383, 385 and 387. Monday the 16th of August consists of chapters 386 to 388 as well as some of 389. And lastly the current day as of the latest chapter, Tuesday the 17th of August chapters 388 to 390. That was a lot, but yeah, it's only been like less than a week and a half since the start of the voyage and a lot has happened. As it stands, the plan is for the Blackwell to have its final refuel and overall check be performed at the end of August. It will then proceed into uncharted waters, essentially leaving the known world. By mid-October, the Blackwell will have reached the new continent with all civilian passengers disembarking. The Hunter Association will continue beyond this to the actual Dark continent and there we have it guys that's the end of the video thank you guys so much for watching i mean it's it's not really about like a video that i made for myself or anything it's not like an analysis or one of the videos i usually make but it's just one of those things right hunter hunter's back this arc is a lot to say the least it is is a big boy very complex lots of characters involved lots of things going on and i wanted to just make a cool video where everything is condensed into not too long i mean 40 minutes pretty long but it's not the it's worth it it's it's, it's impossible to condense this into anything less than this like i tried i tried to snip down the script as much as possible but it just had to happen if you're more of a fan of like looking things rather than re-watching this video every time you want to you know find out something there is a link in the description to all the charts i made for this video so make sure to check that out and yeah that's that's about it this last part of the video was unscripted as you can probably tell i'm kind of just waffling and talking but yeah thank you guys very much for watching and i said it again <laughs> hey i'm leaving that in i'm leaving that in man peace one piece has actually been pretty good recently but hunter hunter back and that's what we care about peace